Today's reading is called Perhaps the World Ends Here. It is written by Joy Harjo. The world begins at a kitchen table. No matter what, we must eat to live. The gifts of earth are brought and prepared, set on the table, so it has been since creation, and it will go on. We chase chickens or dogs away from it. Babies teethe at the corners. They scrape their knees under it. It is here that children are given instructions on what it means to be human. We make men at it. We make women. At this table, we gossip, recall enemies and the ghosts of lovers. Our dreams drink coffee with us as they put their arms around our children. They laugh with us at our poor selves and as we put ourselves back together once again at the table. This table has been a house in the rain, an umbrella in the sun. Wars have begun and ended at this table. It is a place to hide in the shadow of terror, a place to celebrate the terrible victory. We have given birth on this table and have prepared our parents for burial here. At this table we sing with joy, with sorrow, we pray of suffering and remorse. We give thanks. Perhaps the world will end at the kitchen table while we are laughing and crying, eating of the last sweet bite. In remote forests in Madagascar, there is an orchid that is somewhat star-shaped, a delicate branching of white petals called the star of the forest. She may look delicate, and one may think her name comes from her shape, but she is also the star of the forest because she grows in complete darkness. This isn't just a survival technique for her, she thrives in darkness. The orchid gets nutrients from underground fungus, does not have chlorophyll for photosynthesis, but cuts through the forest dirt every so often to attract pollinators such as ants. I loved reading about this orchid. I love knowing that there is thriving in darkness. The orchid is also a reminder for me for the ability for life to survive and thrive in unexpected places. In dark forest floors that though may be threatened by our destruction of the earth, at least for now, host orchids. Beautiful, delicate, perhaps a piece of joy. Thriving orchids that live happily and healthily in the dark. We are all in need of the possibility that exists within thriving orchids. In my work as a leader of the organization UU Mass Action, working alongside organizers on legislation, advocacy, and change in the areas of climate, environmental justice, indigenous decarceration, immigrant, and economic justice, I feel a need for this possibility. In these movement spaces, doing this work, I find myself standing in a somewhat awkward space of not being very hopeful, but having hope for the possibility of hope. 
I know that people have the capacity to do better, even when I've seen again and again they do not act on that capacity. When thinking about what blocks my ability to move from having hope to just hope, I think about my ability to grieve. I believe that if we take the time and space to grieve and to be grieving, we will have a greater capacity for joy, for delight, and we so need this joy, this delight, to continue on in these movement spaces, to continue on, to remember why we fight. Last summer, Joni Mitchell, who is now 79, made a surprise guest appearance at the Newport Jazz Festival. She sang Both Sides Now with Brandy Carlisle. This is a beautiful, haunting, and definitely sad sounding song. And when I watched the video from the festival, I did not weep, I sobbed. I'm sure many of you have experienced songs, art, moments that feel that are breaking you open. I think this song for both me in its melody and lyrics about knowing life and actually realizing you don't at all, and that's okay, broke me open. Now, these moments, in order to truly feel them, they are not something to just be spoken about. They are meant to be felt. They are meant to be sung. So if people know this song, I'm going to sing just a couple of verses, and you are very welcome to join in. Rows and flows of angel hair, and ice cream castles in the air, and feather canyons everywhere. I've looked at clouds that way, but now they only block the sun. They rain and snow on everyone. So many things I would have done, but clouds got in the way. I've looked at clouds from both sides now, from up and down, and still somehow, it's cloud illusions I recall. I really don't know clouds at all. Moons and dunes and ferris wheels, the dizzy dancing way you feel as every fairy tale comes real. I've looked at love that way. Thank you. Part of me was sobbing in this moment because of beauty, part because of loving Joni Mitchell and seeing her still singing, and part of it was I just needed to cry. I was reminded of the activist, the writer, Adrienne Marie Brown, who says, Remember, you are water. Of course you leave salt trails. Of course you are crying. In a sermon about despair written in 2019, Reverend Victoria Safford responds to the despair and grief we're feeling at the times with, time is not an arrow. It is not shot from the bow at the beginning and propelling history inevitably in one doomed direction. There are no straight lines in this round world, no guarantees, and seasons change and movements grow. Hearts beat on and all things like water ebb and flow. Despair can give way to resistance if you voice it in community. Grief can become resilience if you honor the weight of it, if you let others help you bear it. Cynicism can be melted, grim certainty unrusted, apathy can wake up. Apathy can wake up if the music is loud enough and strong enough. In this time of our history when violence rages on, wars begin and continue, our climate feels on edge, if not already in the midst of disaster, there is reason for despair. There is reason for despair, for grief, cynicism, for apathy. 
It is one thing to talk about melting cynicism, having despair give way to resistance, but how does this all come about? How are we not consumed by despair? How do we carve and make room for joy, hope, delight, the things that make our world, our survival, worthwhile and beautiful? My recipe for this is threefold. First, don't forget your people. Gather them, cook for them, care for them, sing for them, love them in all the ways. And also be gathered. Let your people gather you, cook for you, love you. Gather people around the kitchen table where Joy Harjo, the author of the poem of this morning, tells us life ends and begins. Gather your people, be gathered, and then, number two, let yourself cry, let yourself grieve. And finally, after being gathered, after grieving, we remind ourselves why we survive. This is the part where we dance, we eat the food we have cooked, we sing, we remember that our survival is beautiful. Do not forget your people, let yourself cry and grieve, and then remember why we want to survive. Often before I board a plane, I text many, many, many people. I then turn my phone on airplane mode, and when I land and turn it on, it dings and starts filling up with texts, with messages from so many people I love. Do things such as this. Remind people that you love them. Open yourself to being reminded that they love you. Be with people and remember that life wants life. Next, we let go of despair and let our bodies, our hearts grieve. Once the people have been gathered, fed, and loved, let the grief be felt, let the tears fall. Remember, you are water, of course you leave salt trails. Of course you are crying. Tears that are not the pain themselves, but a release of the pain. A sign of the pain, a physical representation of grief. As a leader, a minister, part of accepting grief is necessary to staying in the work, to staying connected to the world. Accepting grief is part of avoiding despair. Not only do we need to grieve, we are grieving in the midst of so many losses and circumstances that persist, that continue. We are tired of making so many decisions that are not flippant decisions, but that relate to our survival. We are tired of violence building rather than diminishing, tired of hatred being acted upon by violence, by occupation. We are tired of violence at the borders, violence in detention centers and prisons. We are tired of fighting for an earth that some seem to care about and others don't. We are tired, of course we are crying. And as we gather and as we cry, let us remember that despair can be paralyzing but that grief doesn't have to be. In an article about eco-anxiety entitled, How Can I Stay Hopeful as the World Burns? Aisha Mirza interviews Robin Wall Kimmer, author of the book, Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teaching of Plants. Mirza asks Kimmer how she stays hopeful, and she says, the grief is heartbreaking, but what I try to do is feel that deeply, Grief can paralyze us, it can bring us to despair and hopelessness, but when we recognize that the pain we are feeling is ecological compassion, it's love, it's love for a world that is strong and fierce and lets us say, not on my watch. The other day, I walked out of a church after giving a similar sermon about grief. I have a daughter who is nine months old, and she was at the nursery at the time I was giving my sermon. I finished up the sermon and shook a few hands on my way out to pick up my daughter, and I came back to coffee hour. I came back to the chattering, coffee-laden air holding Simone. Someone approached me and said, you must be much more hopeful than you let on. You brought this beautiful baby into the world. And I am. I am much more hopeful than I let on. Am I scared, grief-stricken, and angry too? Yes, but again, life wants life. 
and I have so much hope for this perhaps broken world. I brought life into the world because I believe that there's a greater life for her to live. And so I gather my people, I let myself be gathered. I come home to a sort of big house in Malden that is half finished, half not. We cook meals for each other there, we sing, we say grace. There are two babies that live there. We pass the babies around, we tend to an eight-year-old, we pet a very overprotective and barking dog. We set and create space so that there's room for when the tears come, they can be released. We sweep our floors, we bake bread and lend each other our cars. We make themed cocktails, bake cake, and celebrate the life that is here. We gather, we cry, we celebrate our survival. It is no joke to feel grief deeply, especially when there's so much to grieve but I think it helps when we know that in part to grieve is to love. The last part of my recipe is to act on this love, to remember why we move, why we work to protect this world. For this part of the recipe, do what you love. Experience joy and delight, go see art, go to the ocean, listen to something that makes you laugh. Remind yourself of why you love this life. We are excellent at loving. Let that not go to waste. Our perhaps broken hearts certainly have a lot of territory to cover, but I have hope and knowledge that our hearts can carry it, can carry it, can cover it. I think it's gonna take work, but not more work than we can handle. We do not do it alone, and we do not do it in despair. To want to survive in and of itself is a beautiful thing. And to want to survive in a broken world on flames is even more beautiful. And perhaps it is at its core, hope. Gather your people, let your tears flow, make music that is strong enough, that is loud enough. Let us leave salt tears of despair. Let us nurture our longing to survive. Let us remember why we fight And let us remember this by creating and finding joy, by loving the people who have gathered us. Let us cry and grieve. Let us remember that our pain is love, and we've always had more than enough of that. Of course you are crying. Of course we are crying. Let us let the tears flow as reminders of how deeply we are in love with the world. Be blessed those who mourn and let us survive because of our joy, because of our people, because we have always been good at loving. Amen and blessed be.